when we push our kids too hard, I feel like it almost like it backfires on us or on me personally, I've experienced this where I'm trying to get my kid to do something that they're not ready for. And what that ends up doing is causing them to take longer to do that thing because they're frustrated. Hey everyone, this is Yvette Hampton. Welcome back to the Schoolhouse Rocked podcast. I'm back today with my new friend, Carrie Strong, and we're talking about uh, about homeschooling, <laughs> which is what we talk about on this podcast because it's a homeschool podcast, but we're just giving you just some encouragement to get your year started off right and getting it started off strong with my friend, Carrie Strong, uh, because we all need to be just reminded once again of why we're doing this and uh, you know, maybe you're just getting started. Maybe you haven't started yet for the year. Wherever you are in your homeschool journey, you need to know your why. You need to know why you're doing this so that you don't give up when it gets hard. Not if it gets hard, mm-hmm. but when it gets hard. And uh, God's going to give you what you need in mm-hmm. order to accomplish what he's called you to. Uh, but before we get back into the conversation, I want to say thank you to our sponsor, CTC Math. If you guys are looking for a great online math program, go to ctcmath.com. Try them out for free and see if it's a good fit for you and your family, ctcmath.com. All right, Carrie, uh, welcome back. I'm glad you're back with me today. And um, I want to keep talking about, um, you know, we've talked about the why, and there are so many reasons why we should homeschool. Um, There are so many reasons why we think we can't homeschool. But again, even if we think we can't, the Lord's going to protect us. He's going to give us what we need. And so um, as we're thinking about the why, I know one of the things um, that you talk about in your book is objectives and what objectives we should have, because that kind of goes along with our why. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about what our objectives should be as homeschooling moms and dads. Sure. Yeah. I think, um, I think of my friend Andrea's story who I share in the book and um, she started out wanting to homeschool her kids and believing that they would all be in Ivy League schools of their choice, that they would all graduate with a 4.0, that um, they would be academic like she was academic, um, and she would just have these really well-behaved kids. And I think, I, if I'm honest, like, yeah, I had those same expectations for my kids too when I first started. And I think that it's easy to fall into wanting to impress people, wanting to show off my kids, so to speak, and show how much they know. But both Andrea and myself and many other moms that I've interviewed have really been humbled in that way. Um, Andrea, actually, uh, she went through a miscarriage. She has a kid with ADHD. Mm. She has a dyslexic kid. She has a kid with health problems. I mean, thing after thing after thing, the Lord has um, put these kids in her life. And she says it's because of to sanctify her, but also <laughs> to to really reinstill in her the reason that she really does want to homeschool her kids. And it's not for that GPA or yeah. to get her kids into the best school of their choice. It is because she wants her kids to serve the Lord and to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And to me, that was just so challenging and really relieving that we don't have to meet our cultural expectations. I mean, yes, there are the things that our state requires us to do, but we have so much freedom within that as well. For example, if we... if So if we're required to teach science, for example, we can still teach science, but we can teach how God made the earth and creationism, and we can expand on that as much as we want to. Or if we want to, um, I mean, we, we add Bible to our curriculum and math, we can show math and God's world and just relate it all back to Christ. So I think we, Mm -hmm. we have one audience that we're trying to serve and it's a relief. We don't have to impress And that to me is just, that's what we need to be focused on with our children. Yeah. Amen. We do have only one audience and it is hard not to be pressured by those Mm -hmm. around us. Um, I mean, this might be a really dumb analogy. I don't know why I'm thinking about it, but we're, we're starting to teach our oldest how to drive. And so recently we were driving and, you know, uh, even what, how long have I been driving? 30 something years. When you're driving and you have someone behind you who's in a hurry, Mm -hmm. And you can feel that pressure of them, like they're riding right up on your tail. And you're like, I'm like going the speed limit or maybe even a little bit faster than the speed limit. I'm not going to go any faster because I don't want to get a ticket because you have the one person you need to obey is the law, the cop who might be hiding behind the tree. And you don't want to get a ticket because this guy behind you is trying to push you to go faster. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a silly analogy, but sometimes I feel like that when it comes Mm -hmm. to 
homeschooling is that, you know, we feel like we sometimes have people on our tail who are pushing us to yeah. either move faster or move in a different direction. Yeah. But we don't, we don't, we're not doing it for that person. Right. We don't, it doesn't matter. And I mean, that could be our parents. It could be our neighbor. It could be someone at church. It could be anyone yeah. in our world who has influence over us. And it's really hard to have that pressure behind us of, of people yeah. going, okay, move faster, move differently. Right. And you're like, no, I'm doing the right thing right now. Yeah. And just leave me alone and back off. And uh, absolutely. I feel like I am the hard. one that I'm fighting a lot of times that the pressure comes from me. Yeah. That I, I mean, I used to teach in a, in a, um, not a public school, but a private school. And it's still, yeah. I put that pressure on myself. And I mean, in Michigan, our laws are so laid back here. I mean, we're, we'll probably not get checked anytime soon, but I still like, yeah. I put that, um, I'm like, oh, I need to do this, this, and this for this amount of time. I'm like, no, hold the phone. Like my kids don't even learn that way. Yeah. And I don't, I don't have that pressure. It's, it's more just trying to let myself like yeah. of that. So let's talk a little bit about um, kind of the, the when of homeschooling um, and when to make things happen. How do things unfold? And I know it's not always, you know, according to age, you know, at this specific age, you do this specific thing uh, because all of our kids are wired mm -hmm. differently. But, you know, how how do you know, you know, as we're thinking of that analogy of someone, you know, on your tail t pushing you to move faster, right. we can sometimes do that with our kids, right? For sure. Try to push them to move faster than they're ready to move. So talk about that for a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Um, that's, that's been so challenging for me because I have a, um, my middle son is ready to do, uh, fourth grade, but he's in third grade. And my older son is only ready for third grade when he's in fourth grade. So it's kind of like flip flopped and to try to cater yeah. their education to where their individual needs are. It's, it's hard to let go of where they should be. Um, because in homeschooling, there is no yeah. behind or ahead. It really, it really can just be where right. your where their brain is at, at or developmentally. Um, it doesn't have to be yeah. where it, it should be. So, I mean, my my um, friend Michelle, who I interviewed as well, she has nine children. One of them was ready to read at age four. Another one was not ready to read until age nine. He was in the second grade when he yeah. finally started getting the concepts that he to he, when he finally started putting together phonetics and it just finally clicked at that age. But she says that, um, she had read a book by, um, the more, the, um, Dr. Moore, and he, he writes a book called better late than early. And she felt that it just mm -hmm. gave her the freedom to really go at the pace of the child. So she says, the only thing that we missed out yeah. on were tears and frustration. And by the time that he was in mm. third grade, he was right at the level he was supposed to be because the readiness was there. So yeah. I always say, when, yeah. when do we teach the next concept? When they're ready. Just like, when do they learn to potty train? Yeah. When they're ready. <laughs> I don't sit here and ask you like, Hey, when, they're when ready. you potty train? <laughs> like nobody asks that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even tell you. I have no idea. <laughs> okay, it, doesn't, it really doesn't matter in the long run, what age you started to read. It just the red, the developmental yeah. mind is, I mean, your mind's developed at all different paces. And even according to that book, um, they can say as late as 12 that the mind might not even be ready to read it is when we push our kids too hard. I feel like it almost like it backfires on us or on me personally, I've experienced yeah. this where I'm trying to get my kid to do something that they're not ready for. And what that ends up doing is causing them to take longer to do that thing because they're frustrated. Like I could give you so many more examples. Yeah. Like my daughter, um, she just learned how to ride a bike. She's seven. And I mean, a lot of people might say, well, that seems kind of late to learn how to, to finally take the training wheels off of the bike. But now she's riding just as good as her brothers who are nine and 10. Yep. Yep. And you cannot make it happen. Right. You cannot force a child to learn something or even, you know, like you're talking about riding a bike or potty training, you cannot force a child to be more advanced in an area than right. what they're ready to be. Yeah. And so I love your friend's perspective on that and that all she missed out on was the tears and frustration yeah. Yeah. because so many moms, you know, it, it, and we're conditioned to think this way because it's how the, the traditional school works, whether mm -hmm. public or private, you know, kids learn to read in kindergarten. Okay. Well, some kids really struggle with that and they don't learn to read in kindergarten and then they're labeled as, you know, kids, oh, they might need some help. They, right. you know, they're maybe dyslexic, which maybe they are, maybe they're not, maybe they're just simply not ready for it. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes those kids are the ones who can build a tower out of Legos by the time they're three 
Exactly. And their sibling who's reading circles around them can barely put two pieces of Legos together. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just different. They're just wired differently. And so as parents, we get to be the ones to know them best Mm -hmm. and cater to their learning abilities and to their learning styles as well, which I want to talk about after the break. We'll be right back. What we do at IEW is break through the, the noise of the grammar and the writing prompts. And we say, this is what you do step by step. And I've witnessed it over and over again, both watching Andrew teach and hearing from parents, this is the best writing program. We've made it so easy and made it really affordable. So any mom can teach writing to their children using our course, and we guarantee it. To try three weeks of free lessons, visit IEW.com. We are back with Carrie. Uh, before the break, I we were talking about, um, you know, just how our kids learn. And during the homeschool survival series that we did a couple of months ago, we talked a lot about learning styles. And we had Tyler Hogan come on and he talked about uh, just being able to recognize the different learning styles. If you missed that podcast, you must go back and listen to it because it's absolutely fascinating to learn how our kids' brains work and, and how we can adapt their learning to how God created them. It's a really, really great episode. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about learning styles, which are auditory, visual, and kinesthetic, but we talked about a whole lot more than that. But one of the things, Carrie, that you mentioned in the book is the five learning languages. And I had not heard about that until this book. Talk about that. What, what are the five learning languages and how do they work? Sure. Well, I hadn't heard about it either until I started writing the book. Um, I did a lot of research on homeschool books that were already out there. And a lady by the name of Sarah Janice Brown, she has a book um, called uh, How to Homeschool. It's just a little one that you can fit in your pocket and get on Amazon. But she talks about, um, I'm going to even refer to it, uh, the detective, the creator, the follower, the friend, and the explorer. And she describes each of them into great detail. So I kind of put it into my own words of what each one was, but to me, I, I loved the description of each of these and they're, um, they're user friendly, even for your kids that if you want to go and you, you could even read to them these different ones and they're not so abstract to them, but they're like, Oh, what's the, what's kinesthetic like to them. They're like, Oh yeah, I can relate to that when I'm the detective. So it kind of takes those other learning styles and puts them more into like a, a kid friendly version of it. Um, so the detective Okay. Is he's the one that's like, or he or she, they're out on a mission. They want to go find stuff. They want to deep uh, dive deeper into different subjects and figure out things on their own. They want to discuss, like discovery is their quest. They want to know um, what will I find at the museum or what, how is this thing put together? They'll take things apart and want to put it back together. And just that's, that's me. So I love this. Like when I was a kid, I used to love taking a flashlight apart and figuring out where all the pieces go and then putting it back together. So that's your, that's your detective. Um, and your kids, again, they can fall into all of these categories, but they're probably going to have one sure. that's like that they gravitate to maybe the most. And that can really help you to okay. pick which method or which style of learning to use. Um, but I mean, things change mm-hmm. too. So you have to be kind of flexible as we go, like lifestyles change or kids' personalities kind of right. ebb and flow. So, um, so yeah, that's the detective. Right. Then we have the creator. Does your daughter or like to invent things? Um, and okay, so this is my son, the creator. I will go into his room and not or try not to blow up because it's such a mess. And <laughs> his room is like a wreck all the time. Actually, are both of our boys. But I will, if I look a little bit deeper into the chaos, there are rolls of toilet paper that are put together and there's sticks that they've gathered from outside and cotton balls that they've gathered and made these <laughs> amazing creations. And they're like, mom, look at this like sword and this knife. And like, they're really into like yeah. savage and Indian stuff right now. Um, but it, if I let go of who I am in my um, control freakness, <laughs> then I can discover that yeah. there is so much there. So yeah, that's, that's the creator. Um, and each of these, like I put in my book to what approach might work best for you if there are these different okay. styles. So for example, the okay. creator, he might really thrive on the Montessori method or the, uh, unschooling method. 
let's stop there for just sure. a second. Talk about the Mon Montessori method, yeah. because that's one of the methods that we did not talk about okay. in the homeschool survival series. What is the Montessori method? Yeah, sure. So my mom is a Montessori teacher and typically Montessori is a, is a school that you send your kids to and the teachers there have gone through extensive um, training to do what they do. And uh, what they do is they set the room up into different sections. So you have your math section, your language section, your science section, all of the different subjects are divided up in the room. And under each section are trays or manipulatives for each of those different things. So mm -hmm. it's very hands-on. Um, if your child is a kinesthetic learner, that is a really great approach. Um, I am not a Montessori teacher, but because my mom was, she has all these ideas of what I could be doing with my kids. And she'll give me what's called a lesson. So each time they, uh -huh. they go and they get a tray, with the manipulative and they have to have a lesson of how to use it. And once they've had the lesson, okay, they take out a rug and they can go gather their work and um, bring it to their rug and they work independently on that. And when they're done, they put it away and they can go and pick out a work from okay. any of the stations. So it's really interest led as well, wherever their minds are gravitating toward, they can go to that specific subject go get a tray and work on the different mani manipulatives that are around the room. Um, if you're a okay. homeschool mom, the only problem with that is it can get really, really expensive. So you have to be a little bit creative right. with this. <laughs> My mom just so happened to have like a bunch of the manip manipulatives that she's given to me. Uh, but there's a lot of really good ones. Again, that I list in my book, like here's the top 10, if you can't afford all of the Montessori mm -hmm. stuff, like these are the ones that are for sure. Um, so those... Like I really, really love their, um, I don't even know the name of them, but they're, they're blocks that they use to count for math. So they've got the units that are just one single square. Then they have the 10 okay. bar, then they yeah, have the, yeah. the hundred square, and then they have the thousand cube. Yep. And so a lot of it is just, um, tactile hands-on. You're able to see math. I, I know there's a, a curriculum out there called Matthew C, which I haven't gotten into, but um, yeah, kind yeah. Of the same idea. that's just what I was thinking of. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So yep. very hands-on. Um, so what I did during the preschool years with my kids is I would set up a section in my home that had different shelves and, um, we were only doing like a half an hour of school every day, but they each had their own rug and I had different things that I found around the house. Um, I would have a pouring lesson. Like I'd have a tray with two different glasses on it, one with water, one without, and just to practice, um, using their hands to pour was just one of the works and you can find yeah. stuff around your house and make it easy. Um, we just use like a lot of the leapfrog stuff. Um, Melissa and Doug, just stuff that we already had and even towels or yeah. do like a, a folding lesson. Um, there's a whole practical life that they're really yeah. big into practical life. This is why your kids use toilet paper rolls right. and yep. cotton balls mm -hmm. and sticks from outside and all of that. <laughs> I could see how that would play into right how they explore and create today. Yes, uh-huh, that's true, I never put that in, together. In yeah. the way that they're learning. So, I uh -huh. mean, that's so cool. We're gonna come back tomorrow and finish talking about the five learning languages. Um, this is really interesting um, information. I love that you're sharing this with us. So thank you for being with me again today, Carrie. Yeah. If you guys you. Um, would love to know about Carrie's book, it's called You Can Homeschool. And it's all um, answers, methods, and resources with real life stories by Carrie Strong. So we'll put links to that in the show notes. And then your website again is what? Strongroots.farm. Thank you guys so much for listening. We will be back with you tomorrow. If you've not signed up for our newsletter yet, go to schoolhouserocked.com. Sign up there so you can keep in the loop on all things Schoolhouse Rocked. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you back tomorrow. Bye. Education is discipleship, and this is something I didn't understand until I was probably three years into homeschooling. The Bible teaches us in Luke 640 that when a student is fully trained, he will be like his teacher. And as we look around the culture right now, uh, I think it begs the question, who is teaching our children? Who is teaching our children, and what are they teaching our children? And to me, the benefit, the primary benefit of having my children home with me is I am able to impart my worldview to my children.